Well, good afternoon, family. Good afternoon to those of you who are listening in via, via our website. Greetings to all of you. And greetings to you all from Mr. and Mrs. Evans, who are not present today, but they always love to send their greetings to all of you and their love as well. And I normally will give you greetings from Judy Swanson, but I don't have to do that today because she's with us. It is good to have her uh, sitting out here with us as well. I only have one announcement, family, and that is uh, your prayers are being requested on behalf of the Collins family. Natasha and Christian are home today. They're both very sick. Natasha said she's been feeling pretty bad for the last day and woke up this morning feeling even worse. So, and Christian is not doing too well either. So if you would, please keep Christian and Natasha in your prayers. And that's all the announcements that I have. Well, family, we continue to be faced as God's people with many challenges. Still today, we would like to see the pandemic go away so that things can return back to normal. But right now, that, that, has, that has not happened. But God's people continue to be challenged. Challenged by what's going on in the world and also challenged by our adversary. And one of the greatest, greatest challenges that many of us are faced with is this little thing called the mask. Very interesting and very troubling little piece of whatever this is. But it has troubled many of us. And yet, family, <clears throat> I want to remind us today that our adversary still is like a roaring lion. He is going to do everything he can to bring us down. And I hope that we're not letting the mask bring us down. Now, I am tormented daily with this thing. And I mean daily. With my line of work and the things that are required of us uh, in the trucking industry as safety manager of the company here in Knoxville, Tennessee, I am challenged daily about the mask. And if anyone walks into my office and says two words, pandemic or mask, I tell them to take a number. They ask me what number would I take? Number 1,442. And they ask me, well, what number are you serving? Number one. Because this brings about a lot of challenges for all of us. But yet, I want to ask a question of us today. God's people are affected by what's going on in this world, whether it be the troubles with race relations, social justicing, and what's going on with this pandemic. We all are being challenged by this in one way or another. Is wearing a mask or a covering over our faces causing many of us as God's people to question our faith with God? Do many of us or some of us think that God is up high looking down at us, shaking his head at us saying, woe ye a little faith? Some feel that the government's directives are causing many of God's people to doubt and not have faith in God, or begin to question God. The message today is about God's people. It's not about the world. It's about you and me and how we're doing through the times in which we live. Are we showing a lack of faith? Or are we showing that we do have faith in God? Well, what's the right answer? What are the wrong answers? This afternoon, family, let's take a look at being faithful and being obedient to God first. Being faithful and being obedient 
to God first. Now, we find the definitions of faith in Hebrews 11. Now, I'd like to share a little story with all of you before I begin. Because as I said, this little thing here causes a lot of grief in my personal life every day, in my work life every day. Last week, Lee and I had the opportunity to, to go and visit my wife, her mom. They opened the nursing home back up for a while, and we were allowed a 30-minute visit, but we had to make a 24-hour in advance appointment to see her. So last Sabbath, I drove up to Indianapolis for that 11 o'clock appointment to visit with my wife. Prior to arriving there, Leah calls me and says, Dad, they have reduced our time from 30 minutes to now 15 minutes. Well, the focus was, hey, I'm going to see my wife. If it's 15 minutes, I'll take the 15 minutes. But the challenges that were awaiting me were very great. No hugging, no touching, no kissing, no holding hands. Stay six feet apart from her, and you must wear the mask. Now, I left Knoxville, Tennessee, and I didn't want to have to deal with the mask. But yet, I was faced again with the instructions of wearing the mask. Now, our visit was going to be outdoors. It was 90 degrees in Indianapolis, and we're going to be outdoors. And so when I arrived, the nurse came to me and said, Mr. Holmes, I'm going to have you to stand here. We'll go in and get your wife. Great, I'm looking forward to that. But you must wear the mask. Outdoors, 90 degree heat, sun's beating down on top of my head, but I've got to wear the mask. Okay, you know what? I'm going to wear the mask. But see, the other part of the problem was she was going to have to wear the mask also. Now, it's trouble enough with her that with her dementia in recognizing me without a mask on. So how is this going to work out? Well, I decided not to fight with it. If those are the rules, I'm going to abide by the rules. I'm going to wear the mask. And so they bring her out. The nurse came out and wanted to take my temperature. And I'm thinking to myself, I've been standing out here in this heat for 15 minutes. The sun is beating down on the top of my head. I wasn't smart enough to wear a cap or some type of covering. And now you want to take my temperature. Okay, we'll have it your way. My temperature was never taken. We moved forward. So now the 15-minute visit that we were to have with her was being interrupted because it was taking us 15 minutes just to get her familiar with being outdoors and where she's going to be. And so she struggled with everyone because she didn't understand what was going on. And I had a feeling that this would happen. And then the greater challenge for them was Mrs. Holmes, we have to put this mask on your face. And she grabbed that mask, and she shook that mask at them and told them that she was not going to have this. And I stood back and said, yeah, that's my woman. There will be no mask worn today. And then the nurse came over to me and said, Mr. Holmes, we're having a problem she has to wear her mask. I said nothing. She already took care of the matter. I walked over to her, and I said, hey, babe, now I have my mask on. She doesn't know it's me. So I walk over, and I said, hey, babe, uh, you got to put the mask on. She looked at me. She says, I haven't seen you in 50 years. So I took my mask off. I said, here I am. But she was challenged with that as well because she didn't understand it. And just like you and I today, many of us don't understand it. We get it. We hear it. But then there's a third element here with that whole process. 
So now, the touching, oh, there was touching because I had to guide her to sit down. She didn't want to sit down. There was holding because I had to hold on to her. Now, I'm not doing this to defy the rules. It's sometimes the rules just don't fit the application. And when you're dealing with someone with dementia, they are already having problems processing and understanding. And there was no thought, no consideration given to that. But I chose to follow the rules as best as I could. So we got her seated. She was sitting down. They came over to her after we got her seated. And they said, now, Mrs. Holmes, we have to put the mask on you to sit out here. As soon as they got the mask up to her face, she grabbed that mask and she started shaking that mask at them again. I sat there behind my mask smiling. Yep, that's my girl. That's my girl. And so that struggle, family, over something that's very simple has become a problem for many of us. But yet some say, well, if I wear the mask, I don't show faith in God. Well, is that true? Family, let's take a look at this today. Let's take a look at the title of this message, which is, Father, will you find faith and obedience in me today? Will you find faith and obedience in me today? Let's go to Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, and begin there. Let's define what God tells us that faith is. And let's see if we are not exercising faith or what it is that we're actually doing. Hebrews 11 and verse 1 is identifying faith and what it is. Faith being the substance of things hoped for. Where is our faith today? Our faith is in the hope that God is going to move this pandemic away. Whether he does it today, whether he does it tomorrow, whether he does it next year, our faith is that God is going to remove this pandemic because we know that he can. And we know that if it's his will, he will do that as well. And faith is also the evidence of things hoped for but not yet seen. We don't see it except for in our minds in believing and knowing that God can do this. We exercise faith every day. Now, is my faith being, being shaken because of the fact that the mask is a problem? Or does it lie somewhere else? Verse 3 says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. We have the belief and understanding that the word of God is true. When God created the heavens and the earth, he said it was without form, and darkness covered the land. And yet God did something miraculously. He then brought light and air and water, and he brought a dead planet to life. Now, we have faith in believing that because God's word shares that with us. Now, when we look at the scientist's version of how things took, came, about, came, came apart, or came about, I'm sorry, now we have a challenge in our hands. Do I believe this or do I believe God? Well, if you don't believe God, your version of it is a little bit more ridiculous when you stop and you think about it. And so, therefore, we choose to believe that the word of God is true. And so by faith, we exercise that faith daily in knowing and believing that the word of God is true. And these things happen as God said that they did. And so family, as we move forward, we have to exercise that faith in God. Even through this pandemic, even through the rules when it comes down to wearing a mask. We know that Knox County here in Tennessee has placed an order. The governor has placed an order on on the city, that wherever we go, we're to wear the mask. No, we have a choice. Either we do it or we rebel. 
But family, as we get through the message that God is giving us today, my hope is that we see that it not only takes faith, but it takes obedience on our part to do these things. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch was taken away from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken away, he was commended as one who pleased God. At the end of the day, we have to begin to ask ourselves a question. Did my ways today please God? Did my actions today please God? Did my words today please God? Because we as God's people want to please God. We strive to please God. We desire to please God. But family, some days we fall short. Some days we fall real short. But Enoch was commended because he was one that pleased God. Verse 6 says, and without faith, we know that it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And we believe that because we have God's word and the examples before us that have demonstrated his existence. And he says that he is the rewarder of those who earnestly or diligently seek him. He rewards for those who diligently seek him. Are we diligently seeking God today through the trials that we suffer, the things that we're going through? Are we seeking God's face? Or are we reacting because of the fact that we say, I get it, I understand. But the missing element here is, do we actually apply it? You see, I can get what is being said to us. And I can understand it. But now the will is, will I do it? Will I act upon it? Not just exercising the faith, but being obedient, being obedient as well. Verse 8, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place where he would later receive an inheritance, he obeyed and he went. Today that will become a, a great challenge to us. Can you imagine your husband waking up one morning and says, honey, pack the bags, we're moving. And then she says, where are we going? And then he replies back, says, I don't know, just pack the bags because we're moving. Well, what's driving this? Well, God has said he wants me to go to a place. And she answered, asked, where is this place? Look, woman, don't give me any grief. Pack your bags, we're moving. And then she'll probably reply back and say, okay, I'll tell you what, when you get wherever it is you're going, you send me a letter, email, whatever, and uh, let me know the surroundings and let me know what we're moving into. I may or may not join you. It will be a great challenge today if we don't have faith. You see, the two of us together as partners have to exercise this faith. Verse 9, by faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing, or the childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she was considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man and his good, as, dead, as he is good as dead, came descendants of numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sands on the seashores. All of these who are described here in Hebrews 11 were people who were living and died having faith in God. And many of them did not even see the promises that were made. But they lived, as it says, 
They did not receive the things that were promised, but only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. You know, we have to keep looking forward towards the kingdom of God. Many of us and many of those who have died within the past years, months, and weeks were looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. They were looking forward to the kingdom of God. They believed in that. That was a part of their hope daily. And yet, they died before Jesus returned. But they still had the hope. They still had the faith. They still continued to strive to be obedient to God. You know, Christ told Pilate after he was brought to him by the Jews, when he was asked if he were the king of the Jews, he told Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. Family, what we're looking forward to is not of this world. Jesus Christ has to return to bring the, his kingdom to this earth before things will begin to change and look better. You know, I was about 18 years old. I was in the kitchen. And I saw a mouse. A mouse. I wasn't afraid of the mouse. I was angry that the mouse decided he was going to make his presence known in the kitchen. But the mouse disappeared. I couldn't find that little thing. And so as I go to the counter to get something out of the cupboard, in the outlet between the wall and the cover plate, there was his little tail just dangling there. I was annoyed by that. And I did not understand how that little mouse could get between the wall and that cover plate and crawl up in that outlet to get away from me, as if I was going to crawl up in there and go after him, and which I did. And so that example, that situation has stayed in my mind for years. And when I read Ephesians 4 years ago, in verse 22, where it says, don't give place to the devil. Don't give place to the devil. Why? Because he is looking for any and every way to infiltrate our lives. And he is looking at our lives. He is looking at our attitudes, the things that bother us, the things that affect us. And in my mind, as I deal with myself, even with this situation with the mask, I'm reminded of that little mouse taunting me. And it was like he was dangling his tail so that I could see, ha, he couldn't catch me. And he wanted me to see which way he went. But you know, at that very moment, he, he got the best of me. But you see, family, we cannot allow the adversary to get the best of us. We can't give place to him. So we have to watch and guard our attitudes, our thoughts, the things that we say, the things that we do. Because if he knows that this mass is a burden to you or to me, guess where he's going to be spending his time? He's going to be jabbing at you because of the mask. This mask went from we have to wear it walking into our building, we have to wear it walking through our building. If that wasn't good enough, last week I walked into my office to show you how the adversary really wants to taunt you. I walked into my office and there is a plastic shield around my desk. Oh, you're good. <laughs> you're real good. But then I had to stop and think about my thoughts, what I was doing. Because at the end of the day, I had to begin to ask the question, did my actions please God today? Or did I give place to the devil and allowed him to make havoc with me today? You know, brethren, when Abraham was tested, when he was told to take Isaac from their home and to go up and to sacrifice 
Isaac. I don't think Abraham felt very comfortable about this. I think Abraham stressed over this. Now, you gave us a son, and now you want me to go and sacrifice him? Well, why, why give him to us if that's what you want? But Abraham was being tested. You and I today are being tested. We are being tested. And believe me when I tell you, this thing here is a test for many of us. It's a big test. But hopefully by the end of this message here, I hope that we won't allow this to be like that little mouse with his tail hanging out of the outlet, taunting you moving forward. Now Abraham took his son Isaac and he rose up, Genesis 22 and verse 1. He rose up to take his son Isaac to the region of Moriah to sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain. And God said, I will show you where you would do this. And so early the next morning, Abraham got up and he loaded his donkey and he took him, two of his servants, and his son Isaac. When they had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set up to the place where God told him to go. Now, I don't read in the scriptures where Abraham had a conversation with Sarah. I don't read where Abraham woke up and said, hey, babe, me and the boy, we're, we're going out today. Oh, yeah, and by the way, the Lord talked to me last night. I'll be sacrificing him later on this afternoon, just so, so you're aware of it, Get, you know, giving you a heads up. Wee. Can you imagine that today? Can you imagine that today? I asked my sweet daughter, Natasha Collins, if I could use her and Russell today in the message as Abraham and Sarah today. And she told me that I could. And so she's watching, she's listening. She may regret giving me permission, but hey, she did. Can you imagine today, we all were excited about Russell's trip, taking the boys up north, camping, they're roughing it. They're doing it, you know, outdoors. And Natasha, mom, the wife back home, she's Sarah. And so Russell gets up. He's Abraham. And he's taking his boys. He's told her what they're going to do. He gave her the itinerary for the day. They're going camping. Here are all the places we're going. And she's left behind. And can you imagine Russell leaving her a little card a little note on the kitchen table after they leave. The car's all loaded, the boy's in the car. Bye, Mom! Bye, Mom! Gonna miss you! Tasha's standing there just crying. Bye! I'll miss you too! And Russell vigorously waving his hand. Bye, babe! I'm out of here! They're off. They're gone. Natasha goes back into the house. There's this little card on the table that Russell had left. On the front of it, it says, I love you. And he opens the card up. She opens the card up. And the, on, the, on the inside of the card, he says, oh, yeah. By the way, babe, God talked to me in my sleep last night. And uh, when we get up to the Grand Canyon, oh, I'll be sacrificing Christian. The city of Merrillville would be destroyed. It would be dead silence. Fear went across the land of the city of Merrillville. There was a great disturbance in the force. Darkness covered the land. The highways were shut down. Because Mama Bear is not about to let anything happen to her little cub. Not going to happen. And yet, you know, God is so merciful. I don't see where he did that to Sarah. And I'm thankful he wouldn't do that 
to you and to me today. And if God did do that, I feel and believe that God would give us the strength and the will to go forward. But we have to have faith to understand. You see, Abraham was being tested. Abraham was being tested. I don't know that I would even have the, the nerve to come back and after that trip, if I were Russell, and say, oh, everything went well. Oh, and by the way, you know, something really big happened. You know, God told me to sacrifice Christian. I got him up there on the altar, and I got ready to, you know, to offer him up, and angel came by and stopped me. I don't think I would have came back and told her that either. That would have been just one of the biggest secrets that we would have ever had. Because she would never know that this took place. And I am quite sure, Natasha, there's something that happened on that trip you will never know about. <laughs> because there will be a great disturbance in the force. And it will be bad to be Russell. But yet God is merciful, family. He is merciful to us. He wouldn't put on us more than we can bear. But yet, you know what? We are being tested today. Abraham was tested in his obedience to God to see if he would go through and to do what God had asked him to do. And in that obedience and in that test, God was trying to find out if Abraham would hold anything back from him. And so he found out that Abraham would not, and he did not. And so the angel stopped him from offering Isaac as a sacrifice. You and I today, family, are being tested. We're being tested in what's going on in our land today. Our emotions, our feelings, our hearts are kind of being pulled apart and tossed around because of things that are going on. But yet, in order for us to know what the will of God is for us today, family, this book, the Bible, is where our head has to be. This is where our focus has to be. If our focus is in social media all day, every day, what are the things that are coming out of our mind, our heart, and our thoughts? What's going on in social media? And then what happens is we find ourselves more with this thing in our face and the Bible kind of drifting away. And this is every day, all day in our face. We're in a world, family, where God has called us out of. He brought us out of this world. And yet, how, see how clever Satan is? He's bringing the world back to us. And he's drawing us back into it. Oh, and we want to read. Oh, real? Wow. You know, we're back into the world where God has called us out of. Our focus, our understanding, our attention is in the world. And so our lives are being flipped and tossed back and forth because we are focused in the wrong place. God called you and me out of this world. He has a plan for you and for me. And so, what about our obedience? We get and we understand what faith is. And we exercise this faith. At least we try on a daily basis. And so sometimes we got to ask God, for even more faith in understanding his will and what he wants us to do. But what if God's will is for you and for me to be obedient and wear the mask? Where does this play out in God's word? Well, the church, the leadership, came out a couple weeks ago and says, hey, we want to be unified as one body. In every city, there are different rules that the leaders of those cities have introduced. Some say you don't have to wear a mask. Others say you wear the mask. Some say you got to wear the mask. You got to stay six feet apart from each other. You have all these different rules. But within the family of God, Jesus Christ is the chief authority here. And he leads his people. And so that the confusion is not within his church, because who is the author of all this confusion? We know who that is. That little mouse 
dangling his tail out of the outlet. Satan. And he's taunting us. And he will continue to do that as long as we allow him to do this to us. He is seeking to devour. He is trying to draw God's people back into the world, the world in which God has pulled us out of. So where does our obedience lie today? Well, the church came out a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Franks, came before us and says, hey, what if, what if us wearing a mask during church helps or saves one person? Well, you see, everyone's trying to find the formula that works. The world is trying to find the formula that works in the world. And we as God's people are trying to find a formula that's going to work for God's people. But in order for this to work with us, we have to be at one with God and at one with each other. What's our duty? Hebrews 13, verse 17. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. At the end of the day, even though I may not agree with the mass concept, God tells me to obey him and to obey him first. Hebrews 13 and verse 17, we read, Obey those who have rule over you. And be submissive, for they watch out for your souls and those who must give an account. You see, our spiritual leadership has to give an account to the sheep within his fold. They have to give an account to God. And God holds them responsible, as he holds you and me responsible as well. And he says, let them do so with joy. With joy in serving God's people, and not with grief. Because with grief, that would be unprofitable to you and to me. What is he talking about here? He's talking about us grieving those who have rule over us. Well, you know what? I, I don't... I'm not coming to church. I'm not wearing that mask. I'm just not doing it. Nothing should separate us from each other. Nothing. Because if we don't come under this authority, then whose authority are we coming under? So if I decide today, well, that's it. Not coming here anymore because I'm not wearing this thing. Then whose authority am I under? Because if I'm rejecting the authority of Jesus Christ, because the leadership is following Christ, no doubt we all have prayed about it. Here was a decision that was made, and we have to follow that decision. It's not comfortable. You want to be uncomfortable? Come to my office, wear this thing with a big old shield in front of your desk for 12 hours a day. If you want to be uncomfortable, you want to see what uncomfortable really looks like. One of our co-workers, the company that her husband works for, when the employees come in, they're given their little ID bracelets. The, act, the ID bracelet is act, activated, and it beeps if you come within six feet of another co-worker. It beeps. You want to be uncomfortable? Walking around, beep, 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 and you're in fear because you're going to get written up. You're getting written up because they had the little control panel up there. Oh, Judy Swanson. Judy Swanson, coming to the office, please. You were found within three feet of another coworker. This is your first warning. These things happen today. But here's what God is telling you and me. You know, it was a great blessing. And it's, it's a great blessing for me to be able to to serve God's people with Mr. Evans. Because when I go down to Asheville, I see that unity. The same unity that's here in Knoxville, I see down there in Asheville. I go to London, Kentucky. That same oneness is there as well. When I went to Indianapolis last week and I walked into the congregation there, I see that oneness. I see us following the rules. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're all in agreement with doing that, but 
under the authority of the church, it says, hey, what if? So let us do our part together here as God's people, as God commands. You see, God has given us the instructions to obey those who have rule over us. It's one thing to have faith. You see, I get it. I understand it. But will I do it? Will I do it? Will I do it? The hard part about being in Indianapolis last week, many of those folks, I haven't seen them in years. You know what happened after services last week? I fled. And the people chased me. Because they wanted a hug. And so did I. But I said, stop, we can't do this. We all were laughing in our mask. We were laughing, we were fist bumping, we were elbow bumping. We were happy to see each other. But in the unity, in the unity of this organization under Jesus Christ, we followed the rules. We obeyed the rules. And we have faith that one day this will blow over and guess what? I will greet you at the door with a hug. What about our government? Romans 13, verse 1. Romans 13 and verse 1. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in position of authority have been placed there by God. Verse 2 says, so anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against God and what God has instituted. What are we going to teach others tomorrow about submitting and obeying authority or the authority that's over us? What are we going to do? Are we going to teach them and show them how to do things our own way? Or are we going to teach and show them to obey those who have rule over us as we are being taught today? We must submit to God, family, first. And here... It's what God instructs us to do. He says, if we rebel, we are rebelling against God. 1 Peter 2 and verse 13 goes on to say, 1 Peter 2 and verse 13, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to the governors, as to those who are set by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. You see, he has set two things in motion here. Praise if you do good, punishment if you do wrong. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. These are God's words to you and to me. We know and we understand that it is God who puts the kings on their thrones. He says so. And leaders where they're placed. Why? What has gone wrong here and why is God doing it this way? But remember, family, the world does not want God as authority. It does not want Jesus Christ as the authority. Remember what happened when Christ was taken to Pilate, the Jews wanted him killed. Pilate says, I find no wrong in this man. Why are you bringing this man to me? He said, they didn't want him. They said, they wanted Barabbas. They chose a crook. They chose a thief over Jesus Christ. And God reminds us, in his word. And Christ reminds us in his walk that if they reject you, they will reject me. And if they reject me, they reject the one who sent me. The world has rejected Jesus Christ and God the Father as ones to be in authority. So what the world want, God allows them to have it. And so what does that mean for you and for me? 
family, we still have a responsibility before God to be a light, to be an example, and to find ways to do good to those who may not be so nice and kind to us. You know, in that example of the shield on my desk, one of the owners walked in the other day, sat in the chair on the other side. I'm sitting here at my desk and I'm talking to him through this big shield around my desk. And he says, you don't approve of this, do you? I said, it doesn't matter whether I approve of it or not. You want it here for a reason. He looked at me and says, take it down. Take it down with gladness. I took it down because they saw something is wrong. But you see, until you and I submit, this is what God's talking about here. Until we submit, I get it, I understand it, but until I submit to it, I will not see the benefit, nor will I be in a position to help teach others to understand the importance of obeying those who have rule over us. I have drivers that can't wait until they get their year in. Why? Because after they've been working for us for a year, they want to become owner operators. They want their own truck. Oh, Pete, I can't wait. Because at that point, I will no longer be up under your authority. Really? Who are you going to drive for? Well, I'm staying with the company. I'm driving for the company. Really? Whose name is on your truck now and on that trailer that you're pulling? Oh, that's beside the point. It's my truck. Yeah? Under whose authority? You see, we want to find a way to get away from up under authority. But this is not the way. God wants us to submit. Submit. And I'll talk about it here in just a second. When we have the right to say, I'm not going to obey your authority. God has given us a work to do, family. And that focus has to be on that work. This is our training ground. This is our testing place. This is the place where we are being proven to be the kings, the priests, and the leaders that God wants us to be. And it takes discipline upon ourselves to do the will of God. Throughout this, the New Testament, we see where Christ tells us, I did not come to do my will. I came to do the will of the Father. When he told Peter, when Peter cut off the servant's ear, he says, I have to take this cup. Because everything that Christ told the disciples up to that point had to be fulfilled. And his death was one of those steps that had to be fulfilled. They, they said they got it, but they didn't. They said they understood it, but they didn't. And we see that. The question for you and to me, to, me today is, do we get it? Do we see it? Do we apply it? Big difference. I can read this all day long. I get it. I can read this all day long. I understand it. What is our will? Our will is to do the will of the Father. Luke 10. Luke 10. Let's go to verse 1. Luke 10. Luke 10 and verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them two by two before the face of the cities, the places where he himself was about to go. He said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs amongst the wolves. Don't carry anything with you. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Verse 5, whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if the son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. And if not, it will return. 
Now, interesting, let's go over to verse 9. He tells, us, he tells them to heal the sick and to say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you, but whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us, we will wipe off against you. Wow. What nothing to do with you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near to you. But I say to you that it will be better and more tolerable in the day of Sodom and Gomorrah than this city. Now that's a pretty bad city. Because they have rejected God. And they have rejected the servants of God. Verse 16. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him that sent me. They have rejected the one that sent them. Let's go on, verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and all, and all over the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing. Nothing shall hurt you. And today, you know, we live and we understand that if we follow Christ, we obey God, he's going to protect us. Even through this pandemic, we just heard Mr. Kylo talk about the, the hurricane Hannah going through Texas. God's people, it is such a blessing. When we get these reports, God's people are always protected. They're always protected. I remember one year, as I look at Mrs. Swanson sitting there, and just seeing her just reminding me of this, we were all going to the feast together. The Swansons lived about three miles north of us there in Indianapolis. Her son, their, their son and daughter lived another three miles on the other side of them. The day before we were leaving for the feast, tornadoes came through the town. And I mean, they came through with a vengeance. Majority of everyone was gone. We were going to leave out the next morning and arrive down in Florida that evening for the opening night for the feast. But we couldn't leave because the hurricanes, I mean, the hurricanes, the tornadoes came through. Tornadoes came through. And when those tornadoes came through, they came through with a vengeance. They had counted some 70 different tornadoes in this little town of Indianapolis. 70. Why? Churches were stomped down to the ground. Fields were destroyed. Houses were destroyed. Need to say, we couldn't leave because we were right in the middle of all the turmoil. That Sabbath morning, I rose up. I was disappointed because we were still here. The roads were closed. And in the midst of my frustration, in the midst of my anger, because we were still at home, I got up and I tried to just drive around to see the devastation, see how bad things really were. Our house, you can see in the cornfield, the tornado came straight towards our house, stopped, turned, went around the back side of our house, come down on the other side of our house, turned, and shot north of us. And I, as I looked at the path of the tornado, I said, oh no, the Swanson's house. So I headed up towards the Swanson's house. You saw where the tornado turned, went around the Swanson's house, went on the back side of the Swanson's house, continued northeast. As the tornadoes continued northeast, I thought, oh no, Will and Sharon's house. So I got up the road to Will and Sharon's house. And it looked like every step of the way, God said, no, no. And they were having a hard time trying to understand the path, the rhyme, the reason for these tornadoes and why they did the strange things that they did. Because, see, God promises to watch out for us. He promises to protect us. And if we are doing what we are supposed to do, God's going to keep his word to you and to me. 
I drove around as far as I could to every member's home on the east side, on the south side of Indianapolis. Not one house was damaged or disturbed while all of God's people had left for the feast. I drove down south to our pastor's home. And the first thing I thought about was that big giant oak tree that provided all that shade when we were out at their home. We were having little gatherings out there. I thought, oh no. I got down to his place. It looked like the tree had a finger. It broke, it fell, and it, the point of the branch rested on the peak of the roof. Did no damage, but the tree looked like it was going to completely destroy the house. Nothing. Nothing. This is God protecting his people. And he will continue to protect his people. But see, God's people must do and respond the way that God would have us to do. Our focus has to be on the word of God. Our focus has to be on the will of God. Here I was angry because of the fact that we didn't leave. And I was thankful because I saw God's promise to protect us. We didn't get to leave till later on, but I was thankful to see the blessing. And I'm always thankful to hear the reports when they come in from other areas where hurricanes and tornadoes have gone through and God's people are protected. God will continue to do that for you and for me. He said, verse 19, he says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents, scorpions, and all over the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by no means hurt you. I believe that. I believe that to this very day, and I know many of you do as well. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Verse 21, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, and revealed them to babes. That's you and me. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one whom the Son wills to reveal him. He has been revealed to you and to me. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are your eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and hear what you hear and have not heard it. Christ's will was to do the will of his Father. Our will must be the same, to do the will of his Father. We see things, we understand things that the world does not see and that the world does not understand. I get it. I understand it. Do I live it? Do you live this? Family, we should because we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be thankful for. And we cannot allow the adversaries, adversary to come into our heart and our mind and take something as simple as a little mass to separate us from each other, from the family of God, from the work of God. Over the years in the church, I've seen people leave the church over small things. I've seen them leave over little things. I've seen them leave over petty things. But yet, here is God still serving, protecting, and giving. Our will must be to do his will. That's our will, to do the will of the Father. You see, I can't go out and spout, you know, my thoughts, my beliefs about the world and what's going on in the world. Social justice, what about it? What did the Bible tell us? Perilous times are going to come. I can't go out and choose sides. A side has already been chosen for me and for you. Jesus Christ says, you did not choose me, I chose you. What a great blessing that is. There's nothing that you and I can go out here and do 
to change anything except be an example. Be the light. Let the light of Jesus Christ that lives within you and me, that spirit that lives within you and me, let that be emulated outward. The messages that go out on social media from you and I should reflect the word of God, not the world. If we post something on social media, it should reflect the word of God. Because that's who we're representing, Jesus Christ. If we put anything else out there, whose authority then are we under? Who are we listening to? Because others will be listening and watching you. And it's our example that's under the microscope. Had I not put the shield up and allowed it to be there under the authority of those who had rule over me, then they would have never been able to see the problem with that thing sitting up there. But we have to do it first. We've got to take the step to do it. Jesus Christ said in John 4, verse 34, you have to turn there. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. John 6 and verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. We have a responsibility to Jesus Christ and to God the Father. God called you and me out of this world. And he put us under the authority of Jesus Christ. And under that authority, we have a responsibility to represent him. We said at baptism, thy will be done. We said at baptism, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior. So my life must reflect that baptism, that life of Jesus Christ, what we committed ourselves to. That's what our life must represent today. And if our life is not representing that today, then family, whose will are we doing? Whose will? We have a lot, family, to be thankful for. The world has rejected our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We cannot go back into the world and give up the things that have been given to us. Second Timothy 3, we read. You see, what's happening today must come to fruition. These events have been foretold, and the scriptures have to be fulfilled. He says perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Family, this is not you and me. This is of the world. And this is not the reflection that we are to be making in the world. It's the total opposite. So these times had, have to come to pass. They have to come to pass. Second Peter 1, verse 10. He says, therefore, brethren, Second Peter 1, verse 10, therefore, brethren, be more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an interest will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ says, you did not choose me. John 15 and verse 16, I chose you and appointed you that you should do, you should go and bear fruit. And then your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give. Family, what you and I are experiencing is a spiritual war. We see this over in 2 Corinthians 10. It's a spiritual war. It's a war not of flesh and blood. It's a spiritual war. Our adversary is going to do whatever he can to bring us down. 2 Peter 10, let's go over to verse 5, verse 4. 2 Peter 10 and verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We must bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is being fulfilled. 
we have to bring our thoughts into captivity and into obedience to Jesus Christ. First John 5, you don't have to go there, just jot it down. First John 5 and verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. You see, he has given us his word. He has given us the instructions of how we are to be, how we are to conduct ourselves, how we are to live our lives. He tells us to have to allow those who have rule over us to be obedient to them. To be obedient to them. Verse 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this, and, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. He who, is, who, he, he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Victory that has overcome the world is our faith. When do we stop obeying those who have authority over us? Is there ever such a time? Yes, there is a time. You remember those three Hebrew boys back in Daniel 3? They were instructed and they were told that when they hear the music playing, they are to stop and they are worth there to worship the idol. Well, see, this goes against the commandments of God. They rebelled and they said, no, we will not do that. You know, we've gone along with all the things you've said and done, but we're not going to bow down and worship this idol. Well, that's where the line is drawn. When what is being required and requested of us goes totally against God's way of life, God's laws, that's where the line is drawn. And so even if it means that we die obeying God, then that too can be God's will. I get it. I understand it. But will I apply it? Will I do it? Will I exercise it? It's easy all day long, family, to have an argument over things to go against things that we're not comfortable doing, to go against things that we necessarily don't want to do. You know, it's very uncomfortable wearing this mask for me. It's extremely uncomfortable. I need a tic-tac probably every five minutes wearing this thing. I offend myself probably every 20 seconds. I'm like, man, but you know, if I don't wear it, then it's a sin. Where is the sin? Disobeying God. How am I disobeying God? He says to obey those who have rule over you. He says to obey those who have rule over you. This is God's word. At the end of the day, when I'm asking myself, did I please God? Did I honor God? I have to walk the walk of shame right now, family. I have to walk the walk of shame. Because there have been several days I didn't. I didn't. I rebelled against this thing. I don't want to have to wear the mask. It's uncomfortable. I feel like I'm just starving for air wearing the thing. But God says to obey the kings, to obey the rulers, Obey those who have rule over you. When I stop rebelling, and that's what it was, because that's what God says. If you rebel against this, you're rebelling against me. And now I have to repent to God because, well, you see, I should have gone there first. But see, I did my will. I did what I wanted to do. And I didn't want to do this. But the rebelling, the rebelling stopped. When I'm asking God at the end of the day, where did I fail? But when you go to the word, the truth of God, he shows us, you've disobeyed me. You have disobeyed me. Father, how did I disobey you? Read it. I'm guiding you to the scriptures. Now, I'm not saying that any of you did this, but I did this. So I had to stop. 
had to go back. I said, okay, stop fighting. When I stopped fighting, it's amazing how things began to change for the better. When we stopped fighting, you know, I stopped resisting the mask. I wear it throughout the day. It doesn't even bother me anymore now. Why? Because I stopped rebelling. As long as it's on my face, I am rebelling. And so therefore, family, we have to stop rebelling. We have to stop rebelling. At the end of the day, I ask the question of myself. And I have to ask God, did you find faith in me today? Was I obedient to you first? Did I submit myself to those in our spiritual leadership who have ruled over me? And to those in the government seats in following their guidelines? You know, I've got to live and lead by example. Because in the position that I hold with the company that I work, I have to enforce rules, laws. I can't be one out breaking the rules and breaking the laws. And the same holds true for God's rules as well. The mask is a big test. Or should I say, it was a big test because it's no longer a big test for me. Because after I realized that I was in direct disobedience to God, I backed off. At the end of the day, I asked the question, Father, were you well pleased with my actions, my behavior, my words today? David wrote in Psalms 19 and verse 14, he says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Throughout the day, do we offer up this thought to God as a reminder? Because I need your help to let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Jesus Christ told Peter to put up his sword because if he lived by that sword, he will die by that sword. When Pilate asked Jesus if he was the king of the Jews, Christ responded back, and he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Because if my kingdom was of this world, then my servants would fight. You see, his kingdom is not of this world, and we are a part of him. So we have to learn to stand down. I can't get caught up in the emotions of social injustices. When our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was the first person that you would see injustice being done and how he was treated, how he was rejected. I can't get caught up in that because my life, your life, our lives together as a family is reflecting him. At the end of the day, did I make you proud of who I am in reflecting my life to the world, your way that lives in me, your spirit that lives in me. We have been called and chosen not to represent the world anymore or the views of this world family, but to represent the one who called us out of this world. We are the light that should not be hidden. We have been called to do the will of him who we are under the authority of. It is his will that we're doing. And so we were reminded, 1 Peter 4 and verse 12, don't think this is strange. This thing that's happening to you, don't think this is strange. This is to test you. At the end of the day, this is no longer family. This mass thing is no longer a test for me. I get it. I understand it. And I have the will to obey God first. To obey God first. Because when I obey God first, then I stop rebelling. That's my story that I share with you. And so today, family, we just took a moment to take a look at how Satan 
is like that little mouse dangling his little tail at the bottom of the outlet, taunting us. Do you know how difficult that was to sit there First, try to figure out how in the world you got between the wall and the cover plate to begin with. And then you're going to sit there and just dangle your little tail at me? You know, and every time I would go to grab the thing, you know, it would move. It move. So he must have had himself turned around and they're just laughing at me. Well, you know, that's what Satan does. Satan is out to destroy us and he's going to use any and everything to bring you and me down. We were told, don't give him the opportunity. Don't give place to the devil. We've got to learn to stand up every day. And when our thoughts and our attitudes are not reflecting the word of God, we've got to be bold enough to say, not today. Not today. I am going to obey God. I am not going to submit to my will, but to the will of him who sent Jesus Christ and placed him as authority and the head of my life. Can we do that? We get it. We understand it. But will we do it? And so at the end of the day, we ask the question, Father, did my way, my actions, my words, and my thoughts, were they pleasing to you? Will he find faith and obedience in you and me today?